Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, and for our Women's History Month programming, today we're speaking with three leaders who are championing women's causes and issues through their organizations. And I am so pleased to welcome special guests, Anna Oliveira, President and CEO of the New York Women's Foundation, Sorina Khan, CEO of the Women's Foundation of California, and Wendy Doyle, President and CEO of United We. Thank you all for joining us. It is so great to have you here. Exciting to be here. Thank you, Mark. Yes, thank you for putting this together. Great to be with you. Well, Anna, I'm going to go to you. Women are not a, a numerical minority, but women still navigate attitudes and constraints that men do not face. I mean, that's kind of undeniable. So, um, Anna, you've run so many different organizations and have advanced so many causes. Could you give us an introduction of how you view the set of challenges uh, women face? And so, Dina, we're going to go to you and then Wendy, if you can give us your perspective, because one of the things that's so important is that this is a constellation, it's a tapestry of perspectives. And so sharing and interacting and advancing along a very broad front is so important. Anna, what is your view from your perch? Thank you, Mark. And thank you for doing this. This is so important. Um, Although, as everyone here, uh, we like to take opportunity of these periods that get identified like March as Women's Month, right? So I would say that right there is a, uh, you know, is a challenge that we face. You know, there's not a particular month that we should matter or our topics should matter, right? And so what we face is, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to speak from a woman's point of view, but also it's really what we all face. And that is the under leveraging, the under investment, the lack of understanding of full value and equality and worth of ourselves um, from external manifestations of it. You know, we have a lot of data and Wendy certainly, um, you know, is a leader in that in showing that economic disparities, educational disparities, control of capital, um, presence in decision making tables, governmental tables, um, corporate tables, not-for-profit tables, we are uh, under-present. So that means that as a whole, we all lose, not just women, but we all lose because the best solutions are solutions that have everybody that is impacted by them centered at the table. And when we're not there, uh, socially speaking, big picture speaking, and small. It could be in a local reality. It could be in a national reality. Solutions are not nearly as intelligent, as effective, as economical. So what are we facing? We're facing these external forces that still underinvest in us, do not listen, do not see us as equal agents constructing our lives. And of course, with that, we lose control of a fundamental fundamental um, elements of, you know, self-determination, family determination, community determination. And then I think we face another set of challenges, which is when we internalize, when we ourselves internalize these messages that, you know, we are second to someone else, in the case to men, that we are less valuable, that does it really matter what we do? Do we have uh, any less power? of a voice? I mean, less of a voice in yes. terms of, of business uh, uh, politics. I mean, if you look at the constellation of our of our politicians, our businesses, um, and in so many other uh, areas of of civil society, um, I'm an evidence based person. All I have to do is look at any crowd that is a gathering of you know you you designate it and. Uh, who has voice and who who is given platform. And you do see a disparity. Uh, Serena, I want to uh, ask you a question. You know, it's been 100 years since the Equal Rights Amendment, which is very simple. It's just basically um, uh, you, you, you know, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged on the basis of, of sex, right? 100 years since it was first introduced, 50 years since it actually was uh, placed at a vote in in uh, in seventy two. Um, why is this such a such a incredible issue? One hundred and fifty and then fifty years, depending on how one counts, 
after we had this discussion. It just seems so simple, and it's not simple. Why is it not simple, Serena? Uh, well, I think we live in a patriarchal society. We all know that. And um, and to undo patriarchy is a long, probably multi-generational process. I wish it wasn't, uh, but it is because it's so deeply rooted in our culture, in our families, um, the way that we're structured in every part of our society, as Anna mentioned. Um, you know, another day that I wish we didn't have to have today is equal pay day. Uh, and it takes this long. And this is for white women. So Latina women, um, black women, indigenous women all take so much, you know, get paid so much less. And it takes us this long to make up, um, you know, how much a man makes in a year. And so I think it's important for us to recognize these um, discrepancies, these inequities, these injustices. Uh, and then, as Anna said, we really have to center the people who are most, um, you know, closest to the problems because they're also closest to the solutions. And, you know, we have seen that in the way that we at Women's Foundation California, we focus primarily on California. And California, as you know, Mark, is a, a beautiful state, uh, despite the weather we're having today. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, we are one of the wealthiest um states in the world, I think we're now a fourth largest global economy. Uh, and so that means we have great wealth here, but it also means that we have the largest um, numbers of people living in poverty. Who's living in poverty? It's primarily women of color and their children. And so these are, you know, these are the kinds of things that just don't make sense. And we have to figure out how to rectify them. And we do that by investing in, in, in women and gender expansive people who are really addressing these problems um, with creative solutions. And then also, um, you know, making sure that they have a voice. So for example, Latifa Simon got her first grant from Women's Foundation California when she was a single teen mom. She's running for Congress today. People say we take risks, but I think we see opportunity. We see leadership, we see vision, and we invest in it. You invest where there is underinvestment, in other words. Yes. Um, unfortunately, you know, women and girls, um, according to the Women's Philanthropy Institute at the University of Indiana, receive less than 2% of all philanthropic funding, less than 2%. And so now, you know, you if you break that down a little further in terms of investments that are really addressing justice-based uh, you know, that are not just, you know, uh, other things that women and girls enjoy and need, um, but that are really addressing the root causes of inequality and injustice, and also that are led by women of color, that I don't even know what that number is, but it's probably less than 1%. <laughs> Uh, Wendy, I'd like to I'd like to get to United We's take on this uh, on this issue, and and eventually I'd like to come back to the question and take advantage of the fact that here I am, a man, talking with three women who really live this issue professionally and personally, and I'd like to get your sense of what kind of changes I can make um, to to shift. Um, and I'm not talking about superficial changes. I'm talking about real fundamental change. But uh, Wendy, could you could you first give us your perspective on this problem set uh, from United Way? Sure. And it's great to be with Anna and Serena. And thank you, Mark. Um, you know, from United We's perspective, you know, the pandemic really highlighted the issues and women fell back in the labor participation um, about 20 years. So we were making some good, mo we had some good momentum. And 20 years? 20, are we back? 20 years, Department 20 years. of Labor reported that women fell out of the labor market during the pandemic of what it looked like in the year 1988. So, you know, significantly fell backwards and we're trying to rebuild. We've gained a lot back into the workforce, but still the service sector industry is still lacking, you know, challenging to get, you know, the hourly wage worker back to work, just, you know, competitive. Um, and so we have a lot to make up for that, but we learned a lot as a result of that too. What is important to women. And we've heard time and time again, based on our evidence-based research, both quantitative and qualitative, certainly, you know, flexibility in the workplace, 
is really came out as a positive as a result of the pandemic and something that, you know, women need caring for their children, certainly elder care. And Mark, you know, being a champion of paid family leave is something that, you know, would be very helpful. We know that, you know, the federal government has a paid family leave program, but it's not mandated across the country and something that we would like to see. We know that this is important to the recruitment and retention of women in the labor market. So that's just one example of something that is a significant barrier. And here we are on equal pay day, and we're still talking about it. And there's, you know, statistics that really show that it could take as long as up to year 2076 to really level the playing field between women and men. So certainly another key takeaway, a simple thing that employers can do is just banning salary history on employment applications just as an easy tool to level the playing field and especially for hourly workers and people of color, both women and men. So a couple of key things that you can take away, but you know, I think uh, something that an issue, we are working hard at what we can do to get women back into the labor market. And we certainly know childcare is at the forefront of that. You know, being able to access affordable quality childcare when, you know, across the country, as much as 50% of some of the childcare facilities, especially in rural communities, close with no plans to reopen. So it's a tremendous challenge for our country. It's, it's part of the issue is that we have, we grew up with attitudes, all of us did, right? We grew up with attitudes and, and, is, is is part of the issue that our embedded attitudes are actually getting in the way of the kind of, of activities, policies, regulations, support that create this sort of equal equality that we are all aspiring to. I mean, we, we talk a good game, but I wonder whether in my daily activities, are my attitudes such that it reinforces this lack of equality, the people who I vote for, the, the issues that I pay attention to, even the, the qualities that I define as leaderly. I've been in, you know, I, I conduct executive searches for nonprofits. I've been in meetings in which people are characterized as having leaderly qualities, and they're clearly cultural attributes or gender-based attributes that have nothing to do with leadership. And I see you're smiling. You've experienced this, right? Yes, I, I'm so happy you're, you're raising that question because, um, you know, I often like to talk about that um, you're so right, Mark. You know, what happens, Mark, is that, yes, our belief systems, but also the policies, right? They reinforce the belief systems. So, for instance, um, I'm going to talk from, you're talking from the point of view of doing the searches. I'm going to talk from the point of view of hiring. So as Serena said, we believe, women's foundations believe that problems and solutions live in the same place. And that we're going to have better solutions if we have people problems sitting at the Problems and solutions table. live in the same place. So yes. my heart, right? Problem yes. and solution live in my, my heart. Live, my yes. Head. My heart, my heart, my lived experience. And that... That learning of lived experience is usually undervalued in the in the market, in the job marketplace. So Wendy's talking about um, having women come back to work, but the work has to be work that pays, work that is safe, work that values people, that values the lived experience as well, right? And so when we recruit, for instance, I've been um, you talk about what can we do on a micro level. We can look at the assumptions that we make when we post positions on a micro level. We can say we require a BA. What is that that we are requiring a BA for that position? I'm just inventing, right? Is it um, certain analytical skills, writing skills? Is it problem solving skills? Right. How, how do we identify um, the talent and the competence of those without having access to decision-making and access to resources, which is typical of communities of color, produce incredible results in their careers. How do we do that? How do we operationalize the ability to talk to, in a successful manner with people that speak many languages? I mean, I'm not talking about English, um, you know, French, Spanish, I'm, you know, Mayan. I'm talking about languages of class, languages of race, languages of educational um, rarefied environments. 
but negotiate that. So when you are posting a position, when you are hiring, how do you identify those talents? Because those are embedded, embedded ways that we unintentionally, I'm going to all of us here unintentionally may reproduce the same devaluing that you're talking about. You know, so I'm so glad you're landing the plane in what you do. But we all, the three of us, hire people, you know, and when we do that, there is an enormous opportunity to examine what we are val- valuing in people and who we are valuing. When I you also want to... do you do you also um, have yes. this, this issue of, of when you look at how your positions are are uh, recruited? Um, are you also looking at these questions of whether the the um, the attributes of candidates? Mm-hmm. embed bias that could disadvantage certain sets of candidates and certain women. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, that's the, that is basically the core of our work. Um, if we're talking about equity and, and justice and liberation and freedom, that means that we have to really question the status quo. Uh, and so for us, we did away with the, you know, BA, it's just standard language. You kind of just BA right. required, graduate degree preferred. You don't even uh, think about it, right? Right. And the truth is, um, I wouldn't be here if that was a requirement of me. I was not able to finish my BA for reasons to do with financial situations. And so, you know, even though on every job description I probably applied to, it said BA required, graduate degree preferred, I just ignored it. Um, and I and I and I applied for the positions anyway. And so when I got into the CEO role and I saw that the job descriptions that we were producing had that language, I said, well, we can't have that language. I can't in good conscience, a person without a BA who's running this organization. But furthermore, it furthers inequities. So for example, you know, there's a woman named uh, Kim Carter, who's now on our board. She graduated from our mm-hmm. Solis Policy Institute. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was formerly incarcerated. She was drug addicted. She was living on the streets. Um, and now she she said, I went from living on the streets to building affordable housing. She is an incredible entrepreneur, a visionary thinker. She started, a, founded an organization that's helping women who are coming out of the criminal justice system to get back on their feet, to be reunited with their children. So, you know what she says? She says, I don't have a PhD. I have a PhD. So she knows how to solve problems. And she, like me, does not have a degree. And yet we are putting forward some incredible solutions that benefit our entire communities. And Wendy, my mom um, never graduated from college. Uh, She worked at uh, Spencer Stewart, Billington Fox and Ellis, um, uh, Norderman and Grimm. She founded uh, Phillips Oppenheim. Um, Not too shabby. My grandmother never went to college. She was a designer who sold on Fifth Avenue to the likes of Catherine Hepburn and the Rockefellers and and so on, her designs, right? Not too shabby. So this this whole idea of what it takes to deliver outcomes, what Serena is saying is it's not necessarily what our preconceptions say. So maybe we change our preconceptions? Absolutely. And I'd like to just add that there's research out there that looking at the composition of the search committees really dictates who the candidate actually is to move forward. And if we change the complexion and the diversity of who is on that search committee, we may get a different outcome. It's really plays true in the education system, especially hiring superintendents. And most of a research study that's out there looked at, most of the superintendents are white men. And it's because the composition of the search committee was white men. So, you know, to Anna's point, she mentioned in the opening remarks, you know, having diverse perspectives and opinions around the decision making table gets a bad, a good outcome for everyone. And that is true, even in the employment and the search roles. Um, so if we could change what the search committees look like, we may get a different outcome. I think that's I think that's absolutely true. I'd like to talk a little bit about this whole idea, the cultural war thing about woke and uh, 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 Governor DeSantis's whole thing where you know Florida is where woke comes to die. This it, to me it it seems that what you're saying, Wendy, Anna, Sorina, it, it isn't about 
just justice, right? It isn't just about justice. It's also about effectiveness and productivity and uh, impact. Because it seems that, and I can't remember whether it was Serena or Anna made, made the point that we're sub-optimizing use of our talent when we tilt this use of talent in one direction or another. We should be trying to make optimal use of the entire uh, talent pool. So when, Wendy, you're talking about outcomes being tilted, are you basically, by tilting those outcomes, ignoring the contribution the comparative contribution that people can make who might come in with other attitudes, right? Are, are we basically hurting our school systems by having mostly male superintendents as opposed to having these leavened by the full talent of the full possible um, set of leaders? Absolutely. I think, you know, from our perspective, that diversity around the table is critical and in just decision making across the board because and, it improves decisions, right? It improves the decisions, and it, there is um, evidence out there that if you get diverse perspectives around the table, you get a more profitable bottom line. You get a better government decision for everyone. The impact is significant when you have voices um, around the table that look different and sound different than what they typically are. So you know that. I think changing that composition, you know, across any sector, um, you know, diversity at the table is just going to improve, you know, outcomes for everyone. Who does that threaten, Anna? Uh, if, if if I if I am vying against uh, women for a particular job, does that threaten me that uh, uh, as a male who has had comparative advantage? in that process against women, okay? I would think, Mark, that it liberates you. I would think that it liberates you from being dependent on the advantage to feel good about yourself and to succeed. Uh, Nobody should have to have that kind of edge in order to feel that they can get a job, in order to feel that they are impactful, in order to feel that they can lead. So I wanted to say that um, the woke thing, you know, belief systems, in my view, are the glue that has to be woven, you know, to patch together very unjust systems. You know, they are the, the, the oh, let's believe this so that we can continue to do, you know, pay these people less. We can continue to control these lives. We can continue to deny self-determination to people. It's the belief system. And when is that important? That is important when the reality, the the basic realities of life are challenging the existing structures of privilege. Are you basically saying that, that my belief system could be actually hampering the development of not only my community and myself, but also the country, right? It, yes. You know, if I'm, if I'm yes. stuck. Yes. And, yes. And, and, you know, the young people are moving on. And, and so yes. maybe my attitudes yes. are, are keeping me back. Yes. So I'm just going to say, you're talking about, you know, um, where woke dies. I mean, I think that we need to have a compost pile for that, you know, for that kind of attitude um, and rebirth. Uh, the strength that we need to rebirth. But think about a society, think about a state, a city, a country that actually maximizes its people. So where people can actually be themselves and thrive, there's absolutely no need to control gender expression. There's absolutely no need to control and ensure that some people are always starved in their pace. See, this There's is where my, my libertarian streak comes out, right? Why would I want to control anyone else, right? Uh, if it, if well, you because you if are. it benefits you, if it allows you to have more, and your sense of yourself is attached and dependent on having more, that's why I said that for you in particular, liberating yourself from that edge of privilege to have the sense of your value and your self-worth independent of this uneven edge is really also important. 
So, Selena, we just uh, completed a couple of polls. No surprise that 100% of those people attending believe that there is inequality in this society and in the world for, for women. But I'd like to go to the second poll and ask you to comment on it. We asked what the biggest disparities are that, that women face. And we only allowed one choice, but it was it, it basically ended up being three of, of several choices that we provided. And I'd love you to uh, love to have you comment on this. The first was sexual and reproductive health and rights. The second was economic equality, and the third was a discrimination based uh, purely in gender. And and so I, I'd like I'd like you to to deal with with uh, with some of these topics. Uh, in your experience, where is the the centered impact? of the disparities that women face? Is it in sexual reproductive health rights, economic equality, gender-based discrimination? Um, if you had to choose choose uh, one, um, what where do you think that the, the big topic is? Or, or do you reject my restriction of choosing just one? Yeah, I think I reject the restriction because it's an impossible question. They're uh-huh. all related. Um, You know, if you think about economic inequality or um, issues to do with poverty, wages, um, you know, the number one indicator of a woman falling into poverty is having an an unplanned pregnancy and being forced to give birth. Um, Those two issues are very linked. And so and then if you, you know, think about discrimination. Well, what are all the ways that she might be discriminated against? I mean, people who are pregnant are still having to deal with discrimination at work or working conditions that don't, um, you know, allow for flexibility in terms of schedules, allow for um, just issues to do with mobility in terms of, you know, if you think about the people who are delivering our packages to our homes. Um, And so we have to make accommodations for people. Um, And so those three issue areas, I mean, of course, we're living in a time we all know that um, with the Dobbs decision that women's reproductive rights are being restricted in so many parts still of the world, but in this country in particular, um, you know, there are there are states who are restricting abortion, um, even in, in the most horrendous cases. It's a medical procedure. Uh, and so why are women's bodies being controlled in this way? Fortunately, there are states like California that are leading a coalition of governors. I think 21 governors have signed on to a reproductive freedom alliance across this country. We hope that to see that grow, um, whether they're Democratic governors or Republican governors. But in order to provide reproductive freedom, it's so linked to, um, you know, people who are coming to California to access abortions, they need lodging, they need food, they need transportation. And so these are all um, issues that they're going to run into in terms of having the resources, the money for those things. But then also, where are they going to be discriminated against when they try to, um, you know, seek those things? So they're all interrelated. And so if I had, I'm glad that the panelists couldn't take the poll because I really wouldn't have known how to answer it. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting the uh, your your response. Um, that grandmother that I had referenced earlier, who actually saved our family from um, from uh, uh, being killed in 37. Uh, she came to New York. She was the one who was able to get a job. My grandfather mm. tried and tried and tried and w- mm. was able to get <laughs> things, but not necessarily um, on, a, on a consistent basis. She got pregnant. She had to have a backroom abortion. She had to experience it and be at work um, you know, very, very quickly. Um, a lot of these, these acts are really about government control, exercising government control over uh, individuals. So it's, it's really not about um, the, uh, the, this idea of, of, uh, of uh, local control. It's about who exercises control, but it's still uh, uh, this sort of pernicious control over what a woman can and cannot do. If a woman wants to have, have a certain right over uh, reproductive health, why should government be able to say, no, you may not? Wendy, how do you see it? Do you also connect these three different issues of sexual and reproductive rights, economic equality, and gender-based discrimination as Serena does? 
They certainly, I agree with Serena, they all interact, they all intersect, they all interact. Um, you know, at the very core, it's economic, you know, for us, it's economic. And, um, you know, just looking at, you know, as Serena said, just, um, you know, the underserved, the single mom, um, you know, trying to take care of herself and her children, but prioritizing her children over herself. I mean, it is a compounding effect, Mark. And, you know, it's, um, to be able to accomplish and position women to economically succeed, it's, you know, a multifaceted and a long-term approach. And what Anne is doing, what Serena is doing, what we're trying to do, just, you know, even a small little tweak that seems so minor can make a big impact, um, you know, in the long term. But it's going to take all of us to come up with public-private partnerships and solutions in order to accomplish this and get equality for women. So with with you teeing this up, I'm going to go to Anna and I'm going to give Serena the last word. I'd like to talk a little bit about that that issue that Wendy brought up and that you, uh, you, Anna, and you, Serena, have both referenced, this intersectionality between poverty, right, which is, I mean, my, my grandparents were really poor. They had nothing when when this event uh, happened they had no choice there was no social services for them between poverty race marginalization and gender identity uh, anna could you talk a little bit about how we end up creating justice for those people who are least least positioned to to advocate for themselves because they're just trying to figure that day out Mm -hmm. um, excellent question. So I think that um, Serena and I share this in our work. And that is that because we know that by definition, people that are living it where all those things come together, right? Let's say um, gender expensive or trans women of color, um, non-binary people, um, economically, as you said, Mark, and being born not in a family with wealth or not in a zip code with wealth, but um, very wealthy in one's own resistance, resilience, but not in financial means. When we, when we identify that, when we find, when we see people, it's important that we see people, you know, we can't, um, understand our connectedness with people if we don't see them. And it means we are not seeing ourselves either. We're just seeing parts of ourselves. So what we do is we look to see people and we look to bring to people an added value because we don't believe that people are empty. They do not know what they're doing. They do not know what needs to be done, but what they are lacking most of the time are financial resources and the belief by others that are not like them, that come from contrasting communities, that what they are doing is valuable and needs to be seen, supported, understood, and grown. And Example. That's part of the attitudinal question, right? I, yes. a white man of a certain age, need to see. Right. Need but this is also... See. Because we are in philanthropy. This is also a prevalent um, posture of philanthropy. That philanthropy knows better than community because it has money. Money is not the same thing as knowledge. And we need to separate that in the world, right? So uh, what do we do? We uh, create, we invest. We don't determine. We invest in people. We're not investing in models. We're not investing in ideas. We're not saying this is what you need to do or the answer for your problems are this. We are saying we are connected in this, but where you are with the experience and life that you have in your community, you hold the answers for what you think needs to be done. So, so, so do you know, Wendy, do you do you also feel like Anna does that it starts with us all saying, all four of us saying, we don't know best, maybe somebody else does, Serena, and then Wendy, yeah. you can have the I'll, last one. I'll leave you with three examples that just underscore Anna's point. So 
And when we invest in leaders who are, again, living close to the problems, we get incredible solutions. So for example, childcare, uh, a group of parent advocates that we invest in and have trained through our policy institute have expanded access to subsidized childcare in California. So now if you are seeking um, to learn English as a second language, or you're trying to get your GED, that's recognized as a form of job training, which means you can access subsidized childcare. Second example, a group of um, advo young advocates, women of color, um, went to LA County Board of Supervisors because they were gonna allocate $3 billion with a B. $3 billion to build a new jail facility. And these young people who had relatives who are in the criminal justice system said, we don't need new jails, we need community support. We need community services. And so it, they describe it as like a David and Goliath story where they went up against a very powerful board of supervisors. The construction workers union was opposed to them. They won over all those people and reallocated those resources. They passed a measure. It's called Measure J in Los Angeles um, that is now supporting a billion dollars is supporting community services, mental health services, substance abuse, um, and, and, and reimagining the way that we are treating and because because it's more effective use of dollars, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then finally, because we were speaking about reproductive freedom, um, a group of young students went to their student health center at University of California in Berkeley to access medication abortion. And they, they said, oh, we, we don't provide that here. And they thought, well, that's not right. This is a this is a health service. And so through our policy institute a few years ago, we in California expanded access to abortion um, because now all publicly funded universities, the University of California system, the Cal State system are required to provide medication abortion through their student health centers. Um, and that was signed by Governor Newsom a few years ago. Not did he only sign it, but he had a signing ceremony where he invited those of us who were part of this process to the governor's office um, and to see him sign this, this landmark bill. And um, and, and now it's being, you know, I think January. So now it, we get, there's time for the universities to get ready. There were resources through private um, funders that we organized um, to, you know, whatever training they needed, whether they needed ultrasound machines. So all the universities had the resources that they needed. And now in 2023, it's being implemented. Wendy, uh, could you give us an example of how United We triangulates this, uh, you know, in this way between economic equality, sexual and reproductive rights and gender based discrimination to ensure that those people who have the least and are least seen actually have a voice and their ideas and needs are recognized. I think a perfect example would be, you know, just I'd like to to build on the child care challenge. That's something that, you know, is elevated to the top as a priority for us. And we think we know until we get and convene the actual child care providers around the table to really understand what the critical issues are. And, you know, one being, you know, supply not meeting demand and the objective of trying to get new facilities to open so we can get people back to work. But we've really identified that the licensing barriers, um, you know, to actually fill out an application to be state licensed um, in most states is a tremendous barrier. And we're investigating that by doing a national research study. But one, an additional example of what we heard from childcare providers is, you know, the workforce, primarily a woman of color driven um, workforce, you know, primarily women led, you know, women owned businesses in the childcare space. Um, and lack of being able to offer health insurance to employees. It's just expensive. And we've come up with a solution partnering with our state chamber in Missouri, the Missouri State Chamber. And as a result, they are able to offer their health care benefits through their pooled program for their members um, to child care providers in Missouri if they are a member of their local rural um, chamber of commerce. So the, the you know takeaway here is again as i mentioned earlier it's 
coming up with unique, small little solutions to move the ball down the field. And it's going to take public-private partnerships to come up with unique, innovative ideas to solve the problem. And it's not just government. We can't just put it on the child care providers. It's all of us working together to come up with a solution and get people back to work. Mm-hmm. Such an important point, right? I mean, what you're basically saying is so true. In this society, in the world, care, care, caring for people, children, elders, those amongst us who are disabled, those are businesses, those are activities, those are economic um, pursuits that free society to, uh, to thrive, right? If you are stuck caring for a child, you cannot go to work. And if your child cannot be cared for, you can't build a business. <laughs> Even if it's a caring business, you can't build a business. So how do you actually release that energy into society that benefits us all? Ana Oliveira, President and CEO of the New York Women's Foundation, Serena Khan, CEO of the Women's Foundation of California, and Wendy Doyle, President and CEO of United We. I'd like to thank you all for helping to elevate my consciousness uh, and my thinking around this and for instructing me in terms of how my day can be spent in changing my own attitudes. Thank you so much for sharing the work of your organization, your staffs, your boards, your funders. Please also thank your constituents from us who are part of this network of solutions. We really appreciate it. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. Great to be thank with you, everyone. Wendy, Serena. Take care.